Hi everyone, and welcome back to AI News. I'm your host Ethan, and this is Felicia, and we have Raul Ortiz again. And today is gonna be different. Last time we interviewed you, you were on a campaign, and then we ask you all these boring questions about like, what's your policy? <laughs> <laughs> That's not boring. Yeah, I know, but today is different because <clears throat> after I know you, I feel like you have so much that we need to learn as yes. Christian and as a man, you're the masculine this guy, you know, he's, he's a bodybuilder. You know? <laughs> oh, we'll put yeah. a picture right here or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So just to remind us, uh, can you tell our audience a little bit about yourself again? Yes, I'm Reverend Raul Ortiz uh, Jr. I've been preaching the gospel for 40 years and also um, I ran for state assembly in 2022, and we haven't stopped. We're still running for 2024, and uh, I am the proud father of eight children. I have six girls, two boys, five grandchildren, four of them granddaughters, and I just my daughter just had a, a baby a boy in January, so I have my first grandson. So I'm just like el elated. <laughs> wow! Wow! This is a <clears throat> huge family. <laughs> yeah. Eight children. Congrats! Oh, Congrats. thank you, thank you. Yeah, I you you blessed. you're doing the thing that Lord tell you to do, right? Replenish the earth. <laughs> I'm, I'm doing my part to replenish it. <laughs> I heard this strategy because, like, hey, Christian, are you, how how are you going to save the world? Is you have more children because the left they're killing their children, mm. they're castrating themselves and their children, and then within twenty years, if you have more children, if you have more than two, if you have three, you will have. We will in twenty years, we will have double the amount of the leftists. Yes. So, uh, please tell us a little bit about like why are you so masculine in this. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, you know, uh, God designed me in a very, very special way. I guess. <laughs> uh, you know, when I was growing up, I was uh, I was a rebel without a cause, just just rebellious. You know, um, yeah, I, I went, basically went to school just to get in fights with my teachers, you know, and get get in trouble. Uh, but then, uh, you know, when the Lord uh, brought people in my life to share the gospel with me, and then on uh, October 9th, uh, 1982, I was 15 in my bedroom and just falling under deep, heavy conviction from the Spirit of God. And I did not want to go to hell. Um, <clears throat> and so, um, so I called my cousin up who lived across the boulevard from me there in Norwalk, California. And I asked him, Hey, Jim, can I go to your church? He had been trying to get me to go to church since I moved into Norwalk in 1980. And, um, so, so he was all shocked because I was, I was, I was a bad kid. And so, when I, he, so he called me back like, like a minute later, hey, make sure you, you don't wear your shirts that you usually wear. Make sure you wear some, some appropriate <laughs> churches, you know, church clothes type stuff. Well, I, go, oh, yeah. <laughs> I had some bad shirts. <laughs> <laughs> your girlfriend think I'm hot. <laughs> <laughs> did you, did well, you wear your pants like that way? Like very low. Well, we had like the, no, no, my, my generation would just be Levi's. Uh, Levi's, oh. Vance, a surfer, hippie type, you know, uh, stoner. <laughs> and so we, uh, so then I went to church at the next day, October 10th, about 12.05. I received Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. Um, and then God, you know, began to do work in my life. But, you know, as far as that rebellion in me and that, that you know, it, it channeled. It channeled into, you know, to the stubbornness of the doctrine of the faith. You know, it channeled. He began to hone in, you know, the way he built me. Uh, and so now, now I, you know, I, I just live that life according to the glory of God. You know, and, I, and as I look through scriptures, uh, like we were talking about a little earlier, looking at David's life, God really, God really created men to be a little wild. Mm. You know, when you look at David in chapter First Samuel chapter seventeen, and you know he had when he was uh, a little bit even younger, he was already a young man just before he was going to fight Goliath. But God had put him in the, the preparatory school of the field, you know, in work tending the sheep, and here comes a bear, here comes a lion, you know, two occasions. But then you know he kills him with the, his bare hands. Yeah. So he so he had a template, you know. God had put him through that that uh, scenario. So as he began to progress through life, trusting the process, you know, being that 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 rugged individual, and now he sees all the children being faced off by the Philistines, and nobody in Israel wants to do anything uh, with a challenge from Goliath. They're all scared, you know. But here comes a shepherd boy, uh, you know, that was in the sh in the field tending the sheep. Hey. We can't let this guy 
call out our God that way. Mm. You know, someone's got to step up. I'll step up. You know, I killed a bear. I killed a lion. You know, and so he, so the rest of the story, he faced off against uh, Goliath, and he grabbed five stones for his other four brothers. What well, he he had the confidence that he was accurate enough to hit Goliath, and then the brothers wanted to come after him. He could do the same, you know, four more times. You know, so we look at individuals like that, and we see how David lived his life, and he was a man of war. And then when you take that in the Beatitudes with Jesus Christ, when he's teaching, you know, the Beatitudes, you know. Uh, blessed are those that mourn. Blessed are the peacemakers. Well, you know, oftentimes we look at that stuff, and a lot of times us pastors preach it, or, or you know, other faith uh, will preach it, and it's a very passive, very yes. passive way of, of, of looking at it. But really, it's, 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 it's strength. When we, when we talk about blessed are the peacemakers, but well, what do you call law enforcement? Peacemakers, right? Peace mm-hmm. officers. You know, so there's there's strength that has to be there in order to create that peace. You know. Uh, Reagan talked about building up our arms, you know, uh, that whole Cold War with Russia because of the peace it brought to stave off that enemy, right? And so when we think about that, and David, you know, being a man after God's own heart, right? That's what, that's what the Bible calls him. And yet that was a man that, you know, committed adultery, uh, committed murder. But he not only was he a great sinner, he was also a great repenter. And when you look at the book of Psalms and what he wrote in there, uh, he, he pretty much describes every emotional uh, thing that we go through as human beings as described in, in Psalms. And so, so and that, that's David. You, you see him in the book of Psalms just pouring out his heart, crying to God, tears flooding, you know. Uh, but then joy comes in the morning. And then, but then we see this man out there on the battlefield taking care of business as a man, right, to defend his country, defend his kingdom, defend his people, you know. So there, there are some things that we have missed in Christianity that has got to be brought back to the forefront. And, 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 and biblical masculinity is, is that important to bring back. We need not shy away from it. Uh, it's counterculture to right now, but it's more needed than ever because of the feminization of men right now, emasculating men the way they're doing from little boys all the way up. Uh, it's, we're just under attack and we're made to look like it's, it's something not to be desired. They call it ta- toxic masculinity. There's a form of toxic masculinity, but we're talking about biblical masculinity and how we need to be men and understand that we are created a little wild. And we're, as boys, we do like to roughhouse one another. You know, let us roughhouse. Let us, you know, bleed and, you know, break a bone or anything like that. You know, yeah. the, or we'll stop now. But, you know, that's how we're designed. So we just need to be comfortable with that. I, I think you brought up mm-hmm. some important thing because from my opinion, the, the only way to become a man is to control your masculinity mm-hmm. and to control and use it for good. Mm-hmm. I think masculine, like you said, masculinity can go both ways. The, the, it could go very toxic and do some really, really bad thing because men are made to be adventurous and they want, they want to take risk and they want to get the big, huge reward. Or men can be like, oh, I, I need to use this, what I have, the urge that I have to do it for good to protect people, to, when I own a gun, I don't own a gun to get, uh, to, to threaten people. I own a gun to protect what myself and people around me. And that, I think that is what's missing in a lot of churches teaching because like, like you said, churches teaching are extremely passive, very, very passive. We, we don't want to offend this. We don't want to offend that. We don't, we don't want to do what the the, the 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 state government told us not to say um, we want to keep keep our financial thing we just don't want to talk about it because it will hurt us and then uh, people will leave our church is there anything we can do to uh, wake up people like that what, what what or what what's your message to those kind of churches well I mean <clears throat> you know I would just encourage the pastors just to really deep dive into the word of God and, and just and stand tall on it and, and trust the spirit of God um, because that message has got to get out uh, we need not to be ashamed of it and shy back from it and be pressured because of uh, its counterculture uh, I, I think at the end of the day a lot of a lot of people want to be accepted we all want to be accepted yes. and, and 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 there's something that you know there's, it's not a bad thing so to speak but it does become a bad thing when it it, it controls you know, from really getting the message of truth out there. 
And I guess that's kind of going back to, you know, me being rebellious from a you know child to now that rebellious is kind of more honed into where I'm not ashamed to speak on these things, even in the public square, even at work and, and dialogue. And when I was playing, the, uh, you know, eight years of semi-pro football with my teammates, you know, I would talk about this stuff. And not that I, I bring it up. They would just start bringing it up naturally in conversation. And it's, okay, well, you know, I'm not going to let that go unchallenged. You know, they're, <laughs> they're bringing their ideology up. I'm going to bring my ideology up, you know, so and, and, and present to them a biblical worldview. And then, you know, oftentimes that led into deep discussions and, you know, it's always, always been respectful. And, um, and oftentimes they, a lot of them came over eventually on our side and I got to lead some of them to Christ, you know? So, um, it's just really, uh, living your faith out as loud as you can by the way you live it. Right. right? And that you're, and that's what integrity is all about is that your, your life is matching up with your word, your words match up with your actions and that's integrity. And so that's where, where I would encourage pastors to, you know, to stand tall on the scriptures, the, the truth of the word of God and preach it, you know, it, and regardless of what the world's saying. Even if you're the last person on earth to be preaching the truth, you preach the truth, mm -hmm. you know. And, um, and, and going back to being passive, uh, one of the things, meekness, a lot of people have that wrong consumption when you hear weakness. It sounds like like weakness, yeah. but meekness is controlled strength, like we were touching about earlier. Yes, you know, it's like you got the strength and you know it, you know, but you've you've allowed the spirit of God over time to really harness that to control. So now it's control strength, you know. And when you have that control strength, you know, people sense that. I want to bring up something else because you said David is a great repenter. And I think what, what's going on in men's life, the greatest strength is to admit your mistake mm. and repent. That is the only way we can change <clears throat> ourselves and our church around. The biggest problem with church is a lot of pastors, they don't want to repent. They want to say, oh, they, they want to say something like, whatever I taught was always good, was always perfect. Although I'm not a perfect person, but whatever I taught to this church is always good, always perfect, and you should all listen to me. And that, that is a wrong idea because even David repent, and even David do the same thing, and David made mistakes. So why do you think that, what's the problem with these pastors who don't want to admit their mistake, and then when they see the mistake, when we talk about the mistakes, because I, I met a pastor that, that uh, supported abortion. He, he, he was uh, pro-choice. And mm -hmm. I talked to him and he's like, well, I'm a pastor. Well, I, I went to this, this is a seminary and then and I'm just I like- I ordained by <laughs> several yeah. famous pastors. And I'm just like, hey, I hope that we're gonna help you when you meet Jesus. Like, hey, I kill babies. But, and he, he, he got really mad at me. But I think mad, it, it's, it's, it's the wrong mentality. Repent is the correct mentality. Uh, what happened? It, no, I almost said his name. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, why do you think it's so hard to repent? Like for not just pastor, just Christian. Yeah. Yeah. Why is it so hard to get on your knees and say, I'm sorry I made a mistake and then uh, I'm going to do it a different way? I need to see the world in the biblical value. I think that is missing in churches. And I think that is missing in Christians' life. Everyone wants to be accepted. Everyone wants to uh, have their own field of view. And what, 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 what do you, why do you think it's so hard for Christians to repent? Ego and pride. Mm. Kind of hand in hand. You know, there's a certain... The id in humanity is a problem. You know, because the ego wants to put ourselves first. Uh, and then there's a pride. I mean, the, the, you know, it was Satan and heaven, uh, his pride and the, I, the five I wills. I will, you know, do this and then I will send him and be like the most high God. And he was cast out with a third of the angels. Um, so there is, the, it's, it's pride. And it comes right down to it. You know, there's an embarrassment, you know, that they've sinned. Or that they're wrong and they don't want to admit it and they default back. Well, you know, I got, 
you know, all these letters after my name. What do you got after your name? You know, once once they've already gotten that, they've lost the argument. You know, and they probably lost the respectability, really. But in their own mind, they just can't handle the fact that they're wrong because pride sets in, mm. especially if they've gone through so-called formal education. I'm, you know, I'm just I'm more big on self-education. Uh, but they gone through the formal education through academia, and those people are talking about, you know, uh, the, the, you know, dealing with pride. I mean, there's a lot that still get it, and they're very humble. And you can tell those ones how they carry themselves, the very powerful spirit with humility, even though they have this great mind, you know. Uh, but then there's a lot of them that just allow that to, the Bible says, knowledge puffeth up, mm-hmm. right? So when, they, when they're at that level and they have that type of pride going on, it's very hard for them to admit that they're wrong. You know, when you look at David, and when David, you know, uh, set Uriah to the front line, you know, because he had already slept with Bathsheba, his wife, so he committed adultery. He sends out Uriah in the front line to get so he can just, you know, be dead and then he can take Bathsheba. And then after some time has gone by, and then Nathan the prophet comes to him and he gives him this story. And then and, and, and pretty much asks David, hey, what, what are you gonna do with this person? And and he gives his judgment. And you know, he's totally oblivious at this point. Or maybe he did was aware of what was going on, but but it still hadn't hit him yet. But I think he was probably oblivious to what Nathan was really getting at. But then all of a sudden Nathan says, Thou art the man. And man, at that point, conviction set in uh, David's heart. And he felt, he went and, and he cried out to God, repented of his sins, repented of the murder, repented of the adultery. You know, he repented. Uh, and you see that, I think it's in Psalms 51, I think, is where his prayer of repentance is at. And uh, and he just, he, he cried out to God. Later on in the book of Acts, you know, it says that that David was a man after God considered David a man after his own heart. Mm-hmm. You know, here's a man that killed a man that slept with a man's woman, but yet God considered him a man after his own heart. You know, because he was a great repenter, and and, and you know, the Bible says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, sets the, the slate uh, clean. Justification is just just as if I've never done it before. You know, he throws them in uh, as far as the east is from the west, not from north to south, because there's an ending to those points. But east, you can just continue to go east or west. And then he, he throws them in the deepest part of the sea and remembers them no more. So when we receive Christ and we you know get the new birth, all our sins are, are, are washed away, past, present, future. Now it's just the daily process of allowing the Spirit of God to uh, conform us into the likeness of, of, of Jesus Christ. So that's kind of, you know, in a nutshell, why people react like that, why pastors, because there is an ego, uh, you know, and, and, we, and that's where John the Baptist says, you know, I must decrease and he must increase. Get rid of that id. Get rid of that ego. Let the Spirit of God uh, allow to shape and mold and, and uh, convict your heart, you know, and always be soft to the Spirit of God when those moments come and recognize it and just surrender to it, you yes. know, and say your sorrows. As a parent, you know, I've had to say sorry plenty of times to my children, you know. Uh, there's times when in my discipline, I might be angry discipline. I do my best if I'm angry to remove myself, uh, give myself, maybe take ten, 10 deep breaths, <laughs> give 10 minutes or 20 minutes and, 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 and control my strength. Now I go back to my child and then now deal with that discipline uh, action and and then, and then handle it from that, because if I flap the handle while I'm angry doing discipline, well, then I lost control. I'm no longer control, and that's not going to be godly discipline. You know, I'm not always perfect, so when I, when I failed to do that, you know, and then the Spirit of God convicts me, I'm back over to my child and say, you know, I'm sorry for what I did, you know. Um, and it's like that in relation to plenty of times I've failed my wife and, you know, had to go and say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to talk to you this way, you know, I'm very sorry, you know, and then, and then we make up, you know. But you would never get to the makeup, but you didn't have that, right? So you got to get have take. another kid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there's some conceptions sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah. and, and I think that, that the most manliest thing that I think Jesus said was that when he faced death, he, he, he was there praying. Mm. And then 
when, when he, he know that he's going to die and he know that the world is going to go against him. He know he's going to get arrested. And then he said, let's go to Jerusalem. And on the Bible, it says he lead the way. He mm-hmm. lead everyone. Mm-hmm. I think this is, if we're going to learn something from Jesus, it's going to be that. That is biblical masculinity. Yes. He has no fear except for the fear of the Lord. And then he go out there and said, let's go to Jerusalem and I will lead the way and I will be the sacrificial lamb. And to a lot of Christians, the mentality is missing. Um, something's wrong with California. We're missing that, uh, let's go to Jerusalem, that kind of spirit. What can we do to be not scared of the world and it, even in front of death, a certain death, Mm-hmm. say, be like Jesus and go like, let's go to Jerusalem. You know, I think uh, getting back to Jesus and, and leading that charge, you know, and he was a servant of all. Mm-hmm. And what we're lacking right now is servant leadership in the homes, in society, in our churches, in, our, in, our, in the marketplace. Servant leadership. <clears throat> it comes down to servanthood. But that's not sexy enough. We gotta say leaders. Oh, this is a this is a leader, the leader of the church, leader of this, they're leading this, they're leading the charge, you know. And and that word sounds more sexier because you're in the forefront as a leader. Yeah. You know, but in in, in in biblical leadership, when you look at it and you look at this the servanthood of it, you're coming alongside somebody, you know, and say, Hey, let us go. You know, Jesus, let us go to Jerusalem. You know, he's leading the way, but he's a servant. He's the one that washed their feet, right? So he's teaching us a lesson of what true servant leaders are. And to be him that is greatest among you is servant of all. So there's, there's servant leadership that we have to get uh, understand. And, and as we study the scripture, that's why we got to be in a, on a daily basis, you know, just kind of like uh, if you if you got a, a, a warm water, you got your tea bag and you're seeping it in, you know, and the more flavor you want, the longer you keep that tea bag in it and it becomes more the aroma is stronger, the taste is more intense, and that's that's us and the Word of God. We got to steep ourselves in the Word of God more and more, you know, for for the aroma of the Word of God to kind of it's like second nature. We're no longer even thinking about it. It's not. It's like breathing. We just act upon it, and we got to get to that point. And so it becomes aligning our thinking with the Word of God. But if you're not in the Word of God daily, your your thoughts are not going to be aligned with the Word of God, and they're gonna now you're going to be disjointed. And you're going to have those issues. You know, one thing that the, before the, the Last Supper, you know, uh, Jesus told them, you know, to sell your coat and buy a sword. And then they said, here, we got, we got two swords. He says, that's enough. Why, why did the Lord tell him to buy a sword? That sword there is for close combat. He knew that at one point they were going to go out to preach the gospel in treacherous times. They had a right to defend themselves. Somehow in church history, we lost that whole thing. What people like to focus in is in the garden, when when Jesus came to give a kiss to the Lord, Peter took out his sword and whacked that dude's ear off because he probably parried it because he's really going for you know a headshot, yeah. you know. And then he said, "Put your sword away." He goes, "They that live by the sword die by the sword." We always think that's a negative thing. It's not. That is just a true statement of well, if you're going to live that lifestyle, you know, in battle, you know, they that live by the sword will die by the sword. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Because you're dying for defense of your country. You're dying for the defense of your family. You know, that's an honorable thing. So, but it kind of got lost over the years and kind of mistranslated, you know. Uh, but that's, that's not necessarily a bad thing. And so uh, we, we just got to really align our thinking with God's word once again. and understand what true servant leadership is when, when you are given that opportunity in your fear of influence, that you're influencing it for the glory of God, you know, uh, because you're living it out loud. And uh, people take recognition of that, you know. Again, going back to football, when I was playing football, you know, they, they all chose me to be the team captain, to be the defensive captain, to lead in prayer, you know. I, I didn't have to ask for any of that stuff. They just naturally gravitated. I went to my high school reunion from John Glenn High School. So after 20 years... Um, I went there and, and, you know, I had, when I got saved, I, I started a Bible study at John Glenn High School and we got up to like 82 kids. 
and I and I had left John Glenn after my tenth grade year, and I went to my church's school uh, for my eleventh and twelfth grade. So I haven't seen him since you know since the end of my tenth grade year. So I didn't think they would even remember me. But I wanted to go and just kind of reconnect see what happened. I was thirty eight at that time. I went there. I start uh, talking to people, and then they all kind of. Oh, that's that guy that started the Bible study. He's had the Bible study. I was like, I'm kind of amazed. I remember, and the one organizer, dear friend of mine, Tammy Sherman, she uh, she uh, asked me to pray, lead the whole thing in prayer. You know, so it's just, you know, God would put you in know, situations when you understand and you and you line your thinking with the Word of God the best you can. You know, there's still a process. You know, one one bit of advice I can give everybody. Is what I was given when I was 19 by evangelist Dr. Joe Boyd, the evangelist I traveled with. You got to just be constantly learning, constantly learning, and that's that's what that's the key. Do not stop learning. Keep learning. Keep your nose and your eyes on the Word of God. You know, study the Scriptures. Trust the Lord with all thy heart, and lean not to thy own understanding. And all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy paths. You extrapolate all, you know, you could go so many ways of that verse, there's so much deep meaning, but the very essence of it is when it says, trust the Lord with all thy heart, just full reliance on Him, no matter which way the wind blows. You know, if you got to die a martyr, so be it. Apostle Paul said, uh, to, you know, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. And we got a generation now because of COVID that they got the fear factor, even in Christians, that they're all feared up and they're still in mass to this day, a lot of them. And they're still trying to obey uh, the social distancing and only want to do a little fist bump and all that stuff. They're living in fear and they're Christians. They're children of God and they're living in fear. We, we as Christians, if we die, we're in a better place. You know, to die yes. is gain. So why are we going to fear? Why, you know, uh, John 10.10, 10, you know, the thief has come but to still kill and destroy. But I have come to give you life and that much more abundantly. He's come here to give us life, and that much more abundantly. We don't need a fear. You know, if I die of COVID, then I die of COVID. If, if I die some other way, you know, it's in God's hands, full reliance. So we need to get out of the fear. He didn't give us a sp power of fear, or a spirit of fear, but power of a sound mind. You know, so so with that, we again, that's aligning our thinking with the Word of God hmm. and living what we're reading about. Being a doer, that we're not just a hearer, and that's where the church has got to get back to, and it's going to have. To, and the pastors have got to be that servant leader to lead that way to come alongside them, this, this congregation. Hey, this is what we got to do. You know, this is how we got to live. This is what the Word of God says. You know, so uh, it's aligning. So really, we're dealing with mindsets. Uh, that's the battleground. Put on the helmet of salvation, the citadel. You know, of your mind. You know. And then Apostle Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 4 what we need to think about, you know. Um, and we focus on those things and we, and we get a, uh, a check up from the neck up and get rid of our stinking thinking, you know, we'll, have a, we'll, we'll be able to live a more fruitful life for the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. You know, very encouraging. <laughs> yeah. yeah, because I think that's what a lot of people are missing. That the, I think the reason that People can't be brave. People have fear. People mm -hmm. fear the world. I, I, I know someone that work at Disney, and then uh, on the weekend he he go to he go to church like oh give all your heart to to to, to the Lord a hundred percent. But seriously, from from Monday to Friday you are there. When we talk about stuff like that, they go like, what can we do? Mm -hmm. This is how the world is. And when we talk about like the uh, like this homeschool and stuff, they actually go like, "Well, you know, you, your kids need to be social. Your kids need to learn how to deal with other kids. That's a social group, you know. That your kids have to learn. If you keep them in your home, I, I mean, you you're probably protecting them. But hey, your kids need to go out. You can't protect them forever. I, from from my opinion, when I hear that, it's actually." They are putting fear on top of fear and on top of fear and to make them think that they are they are fearless and they can make the right decision to for for, for their kids to be free. I I don't know how I don't know how to what's a good way to put it. But it is weird to yeah. me and it's not biblical. And most people who said something like that are Christian. They 
the, 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 it's sad. Yeah. Yeah, it's sad because <clears throat> there's such a misconception on homeschooling, mm -hmm. you know, which really that's God's first template. That's yes. his main will for parents to take the responsibility to train up their own children and teach their own children. You know, a secondary would probably be Christian schools, you know. Um, so, uh, but when it comes to that very thing, well, you know, well, they're not, they're not going to be social. Uh, they're going to be different. Yeah. I want my kids to be different. That's the yes. point. <laughs> That's the whole point why I'm keeping them and homeschooling them because I do want them to be different. Yes. I want them to shine for the Lord. Yes. I want them to shine and, and, and not be like the world. Yeah. You, know? you, you don't and, want them <clears throat> to be the transgender, to be yeah, homosexual, and, and they, and, to accept all the things, <laughs> right? Yeah. And you know what? They're still well grounded because they got Sunday school. Oh. They, they're meeting kids there. They're playing with their kids there in Sunday school at church. Uh, you know, we're involved in the, in the homeschool community where yeah. they get to see other homeschooler kids. And, you know, we have a little events from time to time. Um, you know, they got cousins they play with. They got neighbors they play with. Yeah. There's sports that they still, my kids still get involved with. They've done judo. They've done baseball. They've done basketball. They've done football. You know, and you know, you know what the overall, the overall uh, comments I hear from other parents Oh man, you got some really good kids. Oh, you're blessed. Your kids are really good. And I was, I said, like, oh well, thank you. But I'm not lucky. That took a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true. You know, because they act like they were born like this. No, my kids are born just like your kids. They're all born sinners. You don't teach them to do wrong. They automatically do wrong. Yes. You got to teach them how to do right. I remember my older son. Uh, he's 31 now, but when he's growing up, the a lot, of, a lot of our, you know, he played football as well. Uh, in the public in the public uh, uh, parks, and um, and the parents are like, oh man, I need my my son needs to be hanging around with your son. You know, he's such a good kid, and your daughters are really good. All this stuff. I'm like, you know, you're lucky. I go, well, you know, look, you know, thank you. Well, luck had nothing to do with it. There was a lot of work that you know my wife and I poured into that, and uh, and also, you know, um, you know, I'm thinking in my head. Should I really let my kids hang around with their kids? Exactly. You know, you know who's going to influence who? Oftentimes, but the good thing is that, my, you know, they're really grounded, and uh, and and my son, you know, he was, had such a heart for God, you know, and he actually led some of his friends to the Lord, you know. So it was really cool to see, you know. And then, and so so and then now my my last four right now they're all homeschooled. They you know my, my first set they went to Christian schools, yeah. and then my son I, we put in a public school once he was in ninth grade to play football because he excelled in sports, you know. Um, but uh, but my other my na next four they're all homeschool, you know. And um, yeah, they're not they're not lacking. Yeah, are they different? Yep. Yeah, I mean when I go around the family and I see other kids, their cousins, and I see, you know, I could, you could tell my kids are more innocent and the way they, they carry themselves and talk and then the way they talk is a lot different and you can see that, but that's okay because that's what I want. I don't yeah. want them to be the same. I want them to be counterculture. I want them to learn how to stand tall for their, for their beliefs and their, their, uh, their faith and, uh, and, and I see, I'm seeing that play out. Amazing stuff today. I think we go a huge circle and then but it's actually about the same thing it's about masculinity and the mm -hmm. biggest thing the greatest masculinity is to be the leader of your house mm -hmm. and to be the leader of your kids and to make your kids become better than you mm -hmm. in loving god i think that is what's missing in our culture these days too many christian they don't want to preach the gospel to their kids they think it's the church's job, Sunday school, you know, just, just have fun over there. And they have no idea what's been taught in Sunday school. Yeah. They have no idea what's been taught in their school. They have no connection with their, their kids. And what they do is they, they go to Universal Studio with them. They go to Disneyland with them. They take a lot of pictures, says that, hey, I'm a great parent. I care about my kids on Facebook. So what they're doing is they're, they're treating their kids like a photo op, you know, like, 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 like a thing, like, like a sign that can hit, like, here is my kid. And that is the wrong mentality in education. And that is not manly at all. If you are a man, be like Raul, have eight kids, and, <laughs> and, and treat every single one of them <clears throat> with respect and make them a better person. Amen. And that's why I, I think this is a main focus that we can do if we want to change the world, if we want to change California, if we want righteousness in, the, in our society, we need to do it and we need to show our kids how to do it. Mm 
So, yeah, thank you so much for coming here. Is there any last thing that you want to say to our audience? Well, I, I, thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure to be with both of you. Uh, but yeah, my encouragement is to just deep dive in the Word of God and allow the Word of God. You make much of the Word of God, the Word of God will make, make much of you. We have the manual on how to live our life and how to live it fruitfully and to be the servant leaders that we need to be. And yeah, men have got to rise up, become biblical, masculine, godly men once again and understand what it means to serve your wife, to serve your children, to serve your community, to serve wherever the marketplace, wherever, wherever God has you at. That's your fear of influence that God has placed you. That's an awesome responsibility because there might, you'll be dealing with people who don't know Christ and you may be the only Christ they can see and that would lead to a lot of opportunities to lead them to Christ. But we start really taking that, you know, um, we can one by one, you know, start to influence our generation f and serve our generation well for such a time as this. Well, thank you everyone for watching. Hope you learned as much as we did. Yeah, well, I I've learned a lot. I learned a lot too. <laughs> oh, to God be the glory. Yes, 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 yes. So thank you, Raul, for being here. Uh, my name is Ethan, and uh, thank you for watching AI News. Please share this video to your friends, to our church, and to everyone you love, because we really have to stand up, and we really have to be like Christ. Like, like Raul said, right? Your children, you want them to be the real follower of Christ. That's all we hope. All right, thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.